Five. The girl from headquarters. It was twelve o'clock when Bond left the Splendide, and the clock on the Mary was stumbling through its midday carrion. There was a strong scent of pine and mimosa in the air, and the freshly watered gardens of the casino opposite, interspersed with neat gravel parterre and paths, lent the scene a pretty formalism more appropriate to a ballet than to melodrama. The sun shone, and there was a gaiety and sparkle in the air which seemed to promise well for the new era of fashion and prosperity for which the little seaside town, after many vicissitudes, was making its gallant bid. Royal Les Eaux, which lies near the mouth of the Somme before the flat coastline soars up from the beaches of southern Picardy to the Brittany Cliffs which run on to Le Havre, had experienced much the same fortunes as Trouville. Royal, without the O, also started as a small fishing village, and its rise to fame as a fashionable watering place during the Second Empire was as meteoric as that of Trouville. But as Deauville killed Trouville, so after a long period of decline, did Le Touquet kill Royal. At the turn of the century, when things were going badly for the little seaside town, and when the fashion was to combine pleasure with a cure, a natural spring in the hills behind Royal was discovered to contain enough diluted sulfur to have a beneficent effect on the liver. Since all French people suffer from liver complaints, Royal quickly became Royal les eaux, and Eau Royale, in a torpedo-shaped bottle, grafted itself demurely onto the tail of the mineral water lists in hotels and restaurant cars. It did not long withstand the powerful combines of Vichy and Perrier and Vittel. There came a series of lawsuits, a number of people lost a lot of money, and very soon its sale was again entirely local. Royale fell back on the takings from the French and English families during the summer, on its fishing fleet in winter, and on the crumbs which fell to its elegantly dilapidated casino from the table at Le Touquet. But there was something splendid about the Negresco Baroque of the Casino Royale, a strong whiff of Victorian elegance and luxury, and in 1950, Royale caught the fancy of a syndicate in Paris which disposed of large funds belonging to a group of expatriate Vichyites. Brighton had been revived since the war, and Nice. Nostalgia for more spacious, golden times might have been a source of revenue. The casino was repainted in its original white and gilt, and the rooms decorated in the palest grey with wine-red carpets and curtains. Vast chandeliers were suspended from the ceilings, the gardens were spruced and the fountains played again, and the two main hotels, the Splendide and the Hermitage, were prinked and furbished and restaffed. Even the small town and the Vieux Port managed to fix welcoming smiles across their ravaged faces. And the main street became gay with the vitrine of great Paris jewelers and coutures, tempted down for a butterfly season by rent-free sites and lavish promises. Then the Mohammed Ali syndicate was cajoled into starting a high game in the casino, and the Société de Bain de Mer de Royale felt that now at last Le Touquet would have to yield up some of the treasure stolen over the years from its parent plage. Against the background of this luminous and sparkling stage, Mon stood in the sunshine and felt his mission to be incongruous and remote and his dark profession an affront to his fellow actors. He shrugged away the momentary feeling of unease and walked round back of his hotel and down the ramp to the garage. Before his rendezvous at the Hermitage, he decided to take his car down the coast road and have a quick look at Le Chiffre's villa, and then drive back by the inland road until it crossed the Route Nationale to Paris. Bond's car was his only personal hobby. One of the last of the four and a half liter Bentleys with a supercharger from Amherst VA, he had bought it almost new in 1933 and had kept it in safe, careful storage throughout the war. It was still serviced every year and, in London, a former Bentley mechanic who worked in a garage near Bond's Chelsea flat tended it with jealous care. Bond drove it hard and well, and with an almost sensual pleasure. It was a battleship grey convertible coupe, which really did convert, and it was capable of touring at 90, with 30 miles an hour in reserve. Bond eased the car out of the garage and up the ramp, and soon the loitering drumbeat of the two-inch exhaust was echoing down the tree-lined boulevard through the crowded main street of the little town, and off through the sand dunes to the south. An hour later, Bond walked into the Hermitage bar and chose a table near one of the broad windows. The room was sumptuous with those over-masculine trappings which, together with briar pipes and wire-haired terriers, spelled luxury in France. Everything was brass-studded leather and polished mahogany. The curtains and carpets were in royal blue. The waiters wore striped waistcoats and green baize aprons. Bond ordered an Americano and examined the sprinkling of overdressed customers, mostly from Paris, he guessed, who sat talking with focus and vivacity, creating that theatrically clubable atmosphere of l'heure de l'apéritif. The men were drinking inexhaustible quarter bottles of champagne, the women dry martinis. Moi j'adore le dry, a bright-faced girl at the next table said to her companion, too neat in his unseasonable tweeds, who gazed at her with moist brown eyes over the top of an expensive shooting stick from Hermes. Fait avec du gordons, bien entendu. D'accord, Daisy. Mais tu sais, en zeste de citron. Bond's eye was caught by the tall figure of Matisse on the pavement outside. His face turned in animation to a dark-haired girl in grey. His arm was linked in hers, high up above the elbow, and yet there was a lack of intimacy in their appearance, an ironical chill in the girl's profile which made them seem two separate people rather than a couple. Bond waited for them to come through the street door into the bar, but for appearance's sake, continued to stare at the window at the passers-by. But surely it is Mr. Bond! Matisse's voice behind him was full of surprised delight. Bond, appropriately flustered, rose to his feet. Can it be that you are alone? Are you awaiting someone? May I present my colleague, Mademoiselle Lind. My dear, this is the gentleman from Jamaica with whom I had the pleasure of doing business this morning. Bond inclined himself with a reserved friendliness. It would be a great pleasure, he addressed himself to the girl. I am alone. Would you both care to join me? He pulled out a chair, and while they sat down, he beckoned to a waiter, and despite Matisse's expostulations, insisted on ordering the drinks. A fin l'eau for Matisse, and a Bacardi for the girl. Matisse and Bond exchanged cheerful talk about the fine weather and the prospects of a revival in the fortunes of Royal Ozo. The girl sat silent. She accepted one of Bond's cigarettes, examined it, and then smoked it appreciatively and without affection, drawing the smoke deeply into her lungs with a little sigh, and then exhaling it casually through her lips and nostrils. 
Her movements were economical and precise, with no trace of self-consciousness. Bond felt her presence strongly. While he and Matisse talked, he turned from time to time towards her, politely including her in the conversation, but adding up the impressions recorded by each glance. Her hair was very black, and she wore it cut square and low on the nape of her neck, framing her face to below the clear and beautiful line of her jaw. Although it was heavy and moved with the movements of her head, she did not constantly pat it back into place, but let it alone. Her eyes were wide apart and deep blue, and they gazed candidly back at Bond with a touch of ironical disinterest, which, to his annoyance, he found he would like to shatter, roughly. Her skin was lightly suntanned and bore no trace of makeup except on her mouth, which was wide and sensual. Her bare arms and hands had a quality of repose, and the general impression of restraint in her appearance and movements was carried even to her fingernails, which were unpainted and cut short. Round her neck she wore a plain gold chain of wide flat lengths, and on the fourth finger of right hand a broad topaz ring. Her medium-length dress was of grey soie sauvage with a square-cut bodice, lasciviously tight across her fine breasts. The skirt was closely pleated and flowed down from a narrow but not a thin waist. She wore a three-inch hand-stitched black belt. A hand-stitched black sobretache rested on the chair beside her, together with a wide cartwheel hat of gold straw, its crown encircled by a thin black velvet ribbon which tied at the back of a short bow. Her shoes were square-toed, of plain black leather. Bond was excited by her beauty and intrigued by her composure. The prospect of working with her stimulated him. At the same time, he felt a vague disquiet. On an impulse, he touched wood. Matisse had noticed Bond's preoccupation. After a time, he rose. Forgive me, he said to the girl, while I telephoned to the Duberness. I must arrange my rendezvous for dinner tonight. Are you sure you won't mind being left to your own devices this evening? She shook her head. Bond took the cue, and as Matisse crossed the room to the telephone booth beside the bar, he said, If you're going to be alone tonight, would you care to have dinner with me? She smiled with the first hint of conspiracy she had shown. I would like to very much, she said, and then perhaps you would like to chaperone me to the casino, where Monsieur Matisse tells me you are very much at home. Perhaps I will bring you luck. With Matisse gone, her attitude towards him showed a sudden warmth. She seemed to acknowledge that they were a team, and, as they discussed the time and place of their meeting, Bond realized that it would be quite easy after all to plan the details of his project with her. He felt that after all she was interested and excited by her role, and that she would work willingly with him. He had imagined many hurdles before establishing a rapport, but now he felt he could get straight down to professional details. He was quite honest to himself about the hypocrisy of his attitude towards her. As a woman, he wanted to sleep with her but only when the job had been done. When Matisse came back to the table, Bond called for his bill. He explained that he was expected back at his hotel to have lunch with friends. When for a moment he held her hand in his, he felt a warmth of affection and understanding pass between them that would have seemed impossible half an hour earlier. The girl's eyes followed him out onto the boulevard. Matisse moved his chair close to hers and said softly, That is a very good friend of mine. I am glad you have met each other. I can already feel the ice flows on the two rivers breaking up. He smiled. I don't think Bond has ever been melted. It will be a new experience for him. And for you. She did not answer him directly. He is very good looking. He reminds me rather of Hoagie Carmichael. But there is something cold and ruthless in him. The sentence was never finished. Suddenly a few feet away the entire plate glass window shivered into confetti. The blast of a terrific explosion very near hit them so that they were rocked back in their chairs. There was an instant of silence. Some objects patterned down onto the pavement outside. Bottles slowly toppled off the shelves behind the bar. Then there were screams and a stampede for the door. Stay there, said Matisse. He kicked back his chair and hurtled through the empty window frame onto the pavement.